We have our service tonight as well. We'll, uh, we'll go to the book of Micah, another one of the minor prophets following the book of Jonah. Look at Micah in chapter number six. The end part of our text here is probably a somewhat familiar verse. It's usually the verse from Micah that I hear people quote from. <coughs> Micah chapter 6, we'll go to verse 6 to begin through verse 8. Here the prophet writes, Wherefore, or wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with ten thousand rams, or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Well, I'd like us to look at these verses. How do we come before God? And how are we serving God? Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this opportunity to come with Thy people tonight and worship Thee, Lord. And pray that You bless now as we look into Thy Word. To pray that You cause to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray that His name would be high and lifted up tonight. I pray that Thou would get all the glory and honor on the services. Pray for each of these requests that were mentioned, Lord, for the sick, that you might heal them up according to thy will. For we pray for those that have lost loved ones, that you might comfort them. Just pray that you would help us as a church to be busy about the work you've called us to do. Help us to be in unity, one accord. Help us to be pleasing and honoring to thee. We pray for Brother Kenny and Brother Larry there out in Oklahoma, that you I bless their time and fellowship there, and you might bring them back safely, Lord. We just thank you for all that you do for us, for your goodness and faithfulness towards us, for Christ and his sacrifice. Lead God and direct the Holy Spirit, I pray. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask all these things. Amen. Yeah. Well, here, the prophet says, some people attribute these words to Balak, when he was talking to Balaam, that is referenced in the previous verse here, but it says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Or how do we come before God? Well, he even goes on to say, And bow myself before the high God. Well, do we even come with such a manner? Do we bow ourselves before him? I think many are like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, though. We can turn over there and read that. Just Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. But I know we've all heard this passage before, but it's a very good example of one who was proud, one who was self righteous, and one who's yet humble and saw himself as a sinner. Luke chapter 18, verse number 10 says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Mm -hmm. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And a publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Well, the main message of our passage here is really humbleness. In fact, I didn't get to read it, but... I think Spurgeon wrote a whole little booklet on Micah's message of humbleness. But here in our in Luke chapter 18, we see these two men that went, went up to pray. One of them. But he didn't go to God 
as a sinner, did he? He didn't go to God humbly. He rather went to God really bragging about what he was. <coughs> when he said, I thank thee, but he wasn't really thankful, was he? I imagine he was somewhat like looking up and saying, God, look at me and look what I have done. When it says, He stood and prayed thus with himself, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and he goes on to even, well, they'll say, even as this publican. That would be almost like me coming in here and praying and saying, I thank thee I'm not like all these wicked sinners out there or even his brother Junior over here. Yeah. No, we ought to consider what we ourselves are. Amen. You know, and then he went on to brag about what he does. I fast twice in a week and get tithes of all that I possess. But we like to do the same thing, don't we? Like to say, God, look, well, all this I've done for you, shouldn't you do this for me? Yeah. That's how many of us look at God when we come before him in prayer. Not humbly and bowing down before him. How shall we come before God? Our text says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? This public in here, he said, wouldn't as so much as lift his eyes up to heaven, but he believe he was in a bowing stance, kind of if you will, and he said he spoke upon his breath or breast. <clears throat> He just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. The publican knew what he was all about. And he knew what that he was just simply a sinner. But it seems that many professing Christians forget that fact today. Our lives have been saved by the grace of God, that he's saved us from sin. And that in our spiritual man, we have no sin. But, <clears throat> Yet, in the flesh, we are still sinful creatures, aren't we? Mm -hmm. well, I haven't figured out how to get past it yet. And if you've figured out the trick, then you can let me know. <laughs> but I'm often like Paul in chapter 7 of Romans. I do that which I hate. Don't do that which I want to do. Uh. And he concludes that chapter with, oh, wretched man that I am. Paul was, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the greatest examples of how a person ought to live in the New Testament, that is. And yet, he himself described himself as a, a wretched man, a, really a wicked, contradictory man. But one day, God will deliver us from this body of death. Yeah. So how do we come before God? Do we come like Pharisee and kind of bragging, if you will? Or do we are we more humble like the public and realizing what we really are? Do we come before him with thanksgiving and joyfulness? Psalms chapter 95 tells us that we ought to come before him with thanksgiving. Psalms 95 verse 2. And you want to read verse 1 as well. Psalm 95, first two verses here say, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. We come to him like that with thanksgiving and joyfulness. Like I said, the, Pope, the Pharisee there, he, he said, I thank thee, but he wasn't really thankful. Truth. Thankfulness or thanksgiving, as it's called here, really requires humbleness. It requires us to realize what we came from, who we are. That's really not anything good in us, but it's Christ in us that's anything that's good. And certainly we should bring our cares before Him. That's what Peter tells us, 1 Peter 5 7, casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. But that doesn't mean come to Him with that. You know, woe is me attitude, doesn't it? You know, God, it's been a rough week. I need you to fix this for me. <laughs> That's how sometimes we go to him with prayer as well, isn't it? Well, we just simply need to lay it at 
the feet of Jesus, if you will, and let him take care of it. You know, I think Brother Larry pointed out a couple times, we, we have a tendency to pick it back up, though, if we do lay it there. Don't we? we say, God, I know you'll take care of this, or God, I know you're faithful, and then the next day or two, we're back to worrying again, are God is able and faithful to provide for all our needs, and yet we worry so much, don't we? Well, he is able not just to take care of our physical needs, but also the spiritual needs. And on the other hand, He's able to not only take care of the spiritual needs, but also our physical needs. You know, sometimes we trust Him with one and not the other. You know, we trust Him with salvation, and, but yet we don't trust Him with our monetary needs do we keep. But then sometimes we say, well, God, I know you'll get us through this, and then we worry that about what the government's doing. Yeah. Well, the government's in control of God just as much as anything else. Isn't it? Well, I, I know they... We can just abounds in our world. Certainly it does. But yet God is still ultimately in control of this world. Well, he has not been... Dethroned by Satan. <coughs> He's not a helpless spectator out there just wishing he could do something about it. I might go as far as to say that every thing that happens is part of his purpose and plan. Yeah. Yes. I admit I don't understand all of it, but yet it's probably not given to us to understand all of it, is it? Anyway, back to our our text here, he said we come before him, but we come before him with the right attitude. Well, Hebrews tells us, go before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy in time of need. Well, he tells us even there to go boldly before him. Certainly we ought to fear God, certainly we ought to reverence Him, and certainly we ought to not think we can demand anything of God, but we can go boldly before the throne of grace. We can certainly go to Him, really we ought to go to Him with confidence of faith, if you will, that He will hear our prayer and He will answer them. But we oftentimes go before Him doubting Him, But wherewithal shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Then the last part of the verse, and through verse 7, he lists all these different things that he can bring to God. He says, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? But all these things here, he says, well, can I bring all these before you, God? And certainly God was pleased with the Old Testament sacrifices. There is something else that pleases him more, isn't there? You know, there the reason for the Old Testament, the sacrifices of the sin. Well, as we looked in our class, we looked at burnt, all the major offerings, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the Peace offering, the trespass offering, the sin offering, they all had their purpose and really they all pointed to Christ. But in all those things, there is something that we'll see here in a minute that really pleases God more than those things. He says, well, shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves of a year old? With calves of a year old, those were pretty it's a pretty uh, valuable item, aren't they? So, yet he says, can I come before you with that? Will that please you, Lord? We bring all these things before God as if 
We're going to please him by them, and yet, what really pleases him is just for us to be obedient, isn't it? Let's go over to 1 Samuel. I'd like to look at Saul for a few minutes. 1 Samuel will begin in, verse, or, excuse me, will begin in chapter 13. I often point to Saul because he's a great example of how we often do as modern day Christians. 1 Samuel chapter 13, we'll begin in verse 9. If you're not familiar with this passage, the Israelites were at war with the Philistines. They weren't doing so good in battle. Saul had stayed over in Gilgal, and someone followed him there. And it says in verse 9, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Saul seemed to be doing the right thing, didn't he? I mean, that's what the law required him to do. These things were in the right context pleasing to God. Verse 10, though, he goes on saying, It came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, or of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Samuel was always calling Saul out. Yeah. Yeah. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? I think Samuel probably already knew what he had done, but he oftentimes had to get Saul to admit that he had done wrong. Or at least he tried to. Saul liked to blame others for his actions. Saul would fit in very well in our society today, I think. But going on, it says in and Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed. Samuel told him he was going to come in a certain time. Says, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash. Excuse me. <laughs> Mishmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. I have not made supplication in the little word. Notice the next phrase here. I forced myself, therefore, offer a burnt offering. Saul was good at making excuses, wasn't he? You know, he forced himself. I'm sure he had a hard time there making the offering. Yeah. Like I said, Saul was, is a good example for someone who did the right things the wrong way. You know, he was offering offerings that were prescribed by the law. And the burnt offering was one that you were supposed to do voluntarily as a Really, a sign that you were committed to God. It was a peace offering. I don't think he mentions it here. Yes, peace offerings. They were to indicate that you had peace with God, really fellowship with God. But Saul was far from those things, wasn't he? He wasn't committed to God. He wasn't in fellowship with God. Well, he's. Starts there and says, You didn't come when you said you were going to come. The people are scattered. The Philistines are gathering their army together. So, you know, I forced myself to do these things because I hadn't done them yet. Saul was not very truthful about it, was it? He was, well, I think Saul was doing something to get, try to get something from God, if you will. Many times we, we're not necessarily us here, but we as Christians are guilty of the same thing. We think, well, uh, if I go out here and do good for a few days, God will bless me. <laughs> but maybe if I put a little extra in the tithe box, God will, will, will return tenfold. <laughs> so there's always a wrong way to do the right thing. There's, well, we come before God, but we don't come before Him in the right way, do we? <laughs> We say, look, I'll do all these works for you, God, but I expect something in return. Well, let's continue on here about Saul. Go on through verse 14. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. 
For now will the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. <coughs> but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. There was consequences to Saul's actions, wasn't there? That's another thing we seem guilty of in our even as Christians in this modern society, that we act as if God is going to wink at what we do. You know, look it over like we didn't really do anything wrong. No, Saul's kingdom was taken away from him. It was given to David. And David, because of his sin, he wasn't able to build the temple. Even going over the New Testament, you had Ananias and Sapphira. They dropped dead before the apostles speak because they lied to the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Well, that time, it says great fear came over all the church. Well, we probably say, well, they got what came, what's coming to them, wouldn't we? That seems to be the attitude of many Christians today. You know, we're not fearful over sin and the effects of sin. We're not, you know, we don't say, well, I better be careful lest I fall into the same thing. The Bible says, take heed to yourself, lest you also fall. Yeah. And we, we say, well, I knew that was going to happen, or they got what was coming to them, or and we kick a brother while he's down, if you will. We ought to restore one that's overtaken the fault. That's the command in Ephesians. And Saul here, he Well, he wanted to make excuses for what he had done. But it was, all of the excuses in the world couldn't change that there was a consequence for his action. He had done foolishly, Samuel says. He had not kept the commandment of the Lord. And his kingdom was taken away from him. Yes, there's forgiveness in Christ, but yet that doesn't mean we're free from our actions. You know, if you go out and kill someone, you can, there's certainly forgiveness in Christ, but yet you're not free from the consequences of the law. <coughs> you know, uh, just because we make things right with God doesn't mean we won't see the effects of sin. Right. So if you go out and do <coughs> drugs for 20 years and then if you were saved in that time, the Lord convicts you of your sin and you turn back to serving Him, you can still expect the effects of those drugs to catch up to you. Well, I've seen it personally. And people who profess to be Christian and they go out and live like the world for a time, yet then later on they see the effects of sin come fast, even if they do get right with God. Sin always has consequences, whether we like them or not. Yeah. So there's that song that says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, will keep you longer than you want to stay, and will cost you far more than you want to pay. Yeah. Sin always does more than we give it credit for. This one. So we like to think we can just you know, dabble a little bit in it and we'll be okay. But mm -hmm. is, we're not careful, very, very careful. We'll end up you know, knee deep in it after a while, and then we'll be in it overhead before we know it. Yeah. We, we seem to be like, like we want to get up as close to as possible and think we're going to be okay. So if I come over here and stand around this edge, I get close enough, I can probably stand there okay. But the problem is I, I keep trying to get a little closer and a little closer, I'm eventually going to fall over. Yeah. And that's exactly how it works with sin, though. We yeah. men try to get close to we can. You know. <coughs> well, my problem is, uh, I'll admit it's with the speed limit. <laughs> I think that a lot of us do that. You know, the speed limit says it's 65. We know that we can push it to 70. 
Sometimes we might push to the 75. And when the blue lights get behind you, they'll let you know that's not acceptable. No. Thankfully, it's been a couple of years since I've had a speed ticket. <laughs> but I'm not going to say I forced myself to do it like Saul did. Because of the people, they made me do it. In fact, I think that's the excuse he makes over in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. Let's turn there. 1 Samuel 15, verses 13 through 22. Going back to verse 10, we get the whole message that the Lord gives Samuel. It says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So Samuel was a, a humble person, wasn't he? He didn't say, See, well, Saul got what came with what was coming to him. Paul got what he deserved. It goes on in verse 12 saying, When Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. Behold, he set him up a place and has gone about, and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou, O blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul thought he was going to smooth things over before Samuel got to say anything. He said, Yo, bless you, Samuel. God bless Samuel. I've done exactly what the Lord commanded. Saul, I mean, Samuel already knew what Saul had done. Verse 14 says, Samuel said, What meaneth in this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So the commandment was to go and destroy it. It goes, yeah. The Amalekites. He was supposed to destroy all of them and everything that they had. That was the commandment from God. Not to take anything from the spoil, not to leave anything living behind. And Saul said, yeah, I've done that. And like Samuel often does, he calls them out. He said, what me is in this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So, said, well... Saul, can you explain why there's sheep and oxen here? If you destroyed everything like God told you to do? I said in verse 15, Saul makes his excuses, excuses again. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So he said, the People, they did it. They, they saved the best so we could offer sacrifices. You know, good intentions don't get you anywhere with God. It might get you somewhere with man. Well, I think there was a quote I can't remember who said it that you're not remembered for what you said you were going to do. So. Like I said, I'm sure he had a hand in this. I don't think he was quite innocent. But, you know, he says, well, we saved the best, well, the other rest we destroyed. That wasn't the command of God, was it? He was to utterly destroy all of it. We can't take the command of God, you know, tweak it how we want it to be, and think God's going to be pleased with it. We can't We'll take what God has said and say, well, I think it would be better if we did it this way. And God would never be satisfied with that type of service. So trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not on thy understanding, and all thy ways know it, and he shall direct thy paths, Proverbs 3 says. But it didn't say, trust in the Lord, but maybe do it your own way if you feel like it. You know, sometimes God's ways may seem difficult. They may seem contrary to the flesh and definitely to this world. Sometimes they even may seem to defy man's logic. But yet we are simply to follow his commands, whatever they may be. You know, some may 
call a sheep. That's really what we're commanded to be like, aren't we, when it comes to serving God? Just be like sheep to follow. You no, know, Saul, like I said, once again, he was doing the wrong, the right thing the wrong way. He was, he said, well, we spared all these, the best, so we could offer sacrifices. God is more pleased with obedience and sacrifices. And that was continue on here. It says, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me. <coughs> this night, and he said unto him, Stay on, or say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. So Saul, and Samuel points him back to his humble beginnings, if you will. So don't you remember where you came from, Saul? Who brought you to where you are? Or whether we're just an average church member, or whether we're you know, the greatest preacher since Charles Spurgeon. The Lord is the one who brought us there. We're His. We ought not to forget where He brought us from, though. And when He gave them this command to destroy Amalekites, fight against them till they are consumed, <clears throat> verse 19 says, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone on the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And he said, Well, I've done what you told me to do. But notice again, verse 21, he blames on the people. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and, or sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, sacrificed unto the Lord thy God, and killed God. So, once again, Saul Saul was their leader. He was the king. If he told them not to take the spoil, you know what? They would have not taken the spoil. But yet, Saul didn't like to take responsibility for his actions and the actions of his people. Well, he's, he said, well, I've done what the Lord told me to do, but people, they didn't do it. What a great leader he was, wasn't he? But we like to do the same thing, don't we? Well, I'm doing what God told me to do with the rest of the church. They're not. You know, with the rest of the country, they're not doing right. Whatever it may be, we like to make excuses and like to look at ourselves in a better light than anyone else, don't we? That's the tendency of the flesh, at least. Say, I'm all right, but everyone else is maybe not so all right. You know, I'm a pretty good person, and I do this and I do that. But yet Saul was not quite as good as he thought himself to be. I always like the quote that Spurgeon said. He said, if any man think ill of you, he said, don't be mad at him, or you're worse than often you, he thinks you to be. But let's go on in our text here, or our passage here in verse 22. It says, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Obedience is what God truly enjoys the most. Sacrifice is pleasing unto him for sure. When he was satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ, certainly when we sin, we can go before him and confess our faults, and he will forgive he is faithful and just forgive us our sins, 1 John tells us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our faults, he is faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's a blessed truth for the child of God. Yet he is more pleased when we are obedient to him, isn't he? And he accepts our con confession and repentance, but he is more pleased when we simply obey him. So it says here, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken to the fat of rams. 
Yeah. But really, there is no need for sacrifice if we obey, is there? So Titus 2, 11, 12 tell us that the grace of God teaches us that we are little so really righteously godly in this present world. But I do have a big question about those who have no desire to live according to God's word. I realize this flesh is weak and that sometimes we get out of sin. Sometimes we have to confess and repent and get right with God, if you will. But yet someone who professes to be saved and have, seems to have no desire to live godly, there's something wrong with that person. Yeah. Let's go back to our text in Micah. Look at the last verse and we'll finish up. Micah 6, verse 8. It says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. He said he has showed thee what is good. And really, these precepts he gives here are really good for anyone to live by, isn't it? Just in a general sense, to, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. <coughs> Even for the wicked of the world, they would simply live by these precepts, if you will. The world will be a much more sane place, I believe. But if man has no desire to follow after these things is the problem. It says, He has showed thee what is good and what that the Lord required of thee. This is what is required of God. These three things here. It's reminding me of Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He says, Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. But Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Two simple things there that are given to fear God and keep His commandments. And that's the whole duty of man, he says. Not just children of God, but all of mankind are to fear Him and keep His commandments. And here he says, these things are required of thee to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So to do justly, that means to use good judgment or to do that which is according to righteousness. We find really what is righteousness in the Word of God only. And throughout His Word from Genesis to Revelation, He describes what righteousness is. Man sets about to establish his own righteousness, but that is not the righteousness of God. Man we see it very clearly in the Pharisees. They thought they were a righteous people, didn't they? And certainly, regarding the law, they were blameless, Paul says. They kept the law, but just like Saul, they were doing it with the wrong attitude, weren't they? And the Pharisees thought they were better than everyone else because they kept the law. Because they knew so much about the law, we ought to be careful of becoming like the Pharisees. He like said, certainly we ought to know as much as we can about God's Word. We ought to live as best as we can by it. But we can do that which is just, or, and we can not walk humbly. We can do that to do justly, and we can leave off loving mercy. In fact, we oftentimes harp on the doing justly part, don't we? But living righteously, living godly, living according to God's word. And that's important. I certainly don't want to diminish that. But we ought not to leave the other things undone, should we? Yeah. In fact, that's, I didn't write down the notes, but that's what Christ told the Pharisees. Uh. He listed off several things that they do that they did and he says they left off the way during matters of the law 
And said, you ought to do the one, not leave the other undone. But yes, we have to live godly, we have to live righteously, but we also can't live off the other things, mercy and grace and love and joy. And we can't go the other end either and be all love and live off and leave off living righteously. That seems to be the world's message of quote unquote progressive Christians today. We just need to be loved and hold hands and get along. Yeah. And certainly we we should be a loving people. We should be a merciful people. That doesn't mean we should just compromise on the word of God and compromise on the way we live and conduct ourselves. But I think Brother Adam often points out usually in the scriptures there's a balance that we need to find. He says to do justly and to love mercy. Do we really love mercy? Are we a compassionate people? I think by and large we leave that one out. Don't we? No. Luke 6.36 tells us that we are to be merciful as God is merciful. God is all merciful, isn't he? Amen. You'll see him, how God has been merciful to us, not we to be a merciful people as well. Really seeing how good he has been towards us, ought we not to bestow that upon others as well? And yet, as I pointed out earlier, we oftentimes are not very merciful. Or we're we're going to stop other people when they're down. We want to act like they got what they deserve. And they, we want to act as if you know, we're better than them because they're not doing the things which we think they ought to be doing. Well, I realize we ought not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We ought to. In fact, specifically, Paul says we ought not to have fellowship with the brother who's called a fornicator. But at the same time, we ought not to say, well, I could have nothing to do with them, a wicked person. Or, you know, I knew they would do that route. We ought to be praying for such a one, shouldn't we? As I said, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. Yeah. It's not about any one of us to fall of sin, is it? The best of us are able to fall of sin just as easy as the worst of us. We should be a compassionate, merciful people. Well, praying for those who may have fallen into sin, praying for the lost around us, praying for really the state of our world, the wickedness in which it has fallen into, but not in a way which we're bragging like a Pharisee. You know, I thank the God that I'm not as the wicked of this world are, but rather. God, have mercy on our nation. God, pray for this particular person that you might convict them of their sin. But Lord, help me not to follow the same thing. Yeah. And, he, and he goes on to say, and to walk humbly with thy God. Is there any other way to walk with God? really isn't, is there? James 4 or 6 says, God resists the proud but gives grace in the humble. Yeah. There's really no way to go before God with a proud spirit, is there? As I pointed out when I preached in at faith, we ought not to have pride as the people of God. I think sometimes we use that as a, we use that word not really thinking about it too much, do we? We ought to be a thankful people, we ought to be glad for what God has done for us. But we not have pride and say, look at me and look what I have done. No, we ought to remember from whence we came. First Corinthians 4, 7 says, who make it thee to differ? The only thing that makes well, someone such as I differ from someone such as Adolf Hitler is simply the grace of God. Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, by the grace of God, I am what I am. We ought not to ever forget that. To remember that will humble us. We really can't have pride to remember that 
We are just simply what we are by the grace of God. That's really the problem with Armenian theology. It boasts up man, doesn't it? It boasts up man to say, look at me. I made this decision or, or works salvation. Say, look at me, God. Look at the works that I have done for you. But you know, the doctrines of grace, as we often call them, they bring man down to where he should be. And a right understanding of them will cause us to see that it's all of God, isn't it? You know what? Remember Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar from Daniel chapter 4 and 5? Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up with pride. He had a mighty nation, he had a great army. He really conquered anybody that he wanted to conquer. But he forgot that it was the Lord that allowed him to do such things. The Lord humbled him. He learned the lesson the hard way, probably the hardest way anybody ever has. He had to live like a wild animal for I forget how long. The Belshazzar was his, his successor, or perhaps the successor of his successor, depending on if you want to believe what history tells you or not. But Belshazzar, he forgot really the God that had blessed his nation. He said, because I was not humbled myself, he said, you know, the rest of the story, that night he would be killed and his kingdom taken away from him. And lastly, let us consider the example of Christ. He is our great example, isn't he? And he was the humblest of humble, if you will. He, he did not come in and say, look at me, look what I have done. As I pointed out from the book of Zechariah, he came lowly riding on an ass, it says, a donkey. He didn't come with, on this poor poster platform where people were carrying him through the city, did he? Let's go over to Philippians, and we'll close. Philippians chapter 2. Being that he was God, if he wanted to, say he could have had a big old palace and a nice fancy place to stay and servants around him to bring him what he wanted and do his bidding. He could have fared sumptuously every day like the rich man. Yet he said of himself that he had not where to lay his head. Well, Christ now make much ado about himself either, did he? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and through 8 say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being fashioned as or, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And I realized Christ had a his purpose in this life, to come to live perfectly and to die for our sins. Yet, he says he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. <coughs> With the flesh, we want to make ourselves a reputation, don't we? We like to have a man look at us and say, look how great a preacher he is, or teacher he is, or singer he or she is. We like to have man tell us how good we are. Yeah. The one, the one came on to Christ and said, "Call him good." What he said, "There's none good but God." Christ would claim that title of good because certainly he was good. Certainly he was perfect, and that even into his flesh, he pointed pointed that person back to God. Said, no, God is the one who is good. Just the same, we have to do the same. We have to say, oh, it's not look at me, look what I've done. It's look at Christ and what he has done for me and in and through me. And it says, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. 
The humbleness will lead us to obedience, won't it? Pride oftentimes kicks against the pricks, if you will. Pride oftentimes wants to go against obedience and say, you know, I, I know better, or I think I can do it this way better. Yeah. But oh, how we ought to humble ourselves, even as Christ humbled himself. Well, whether that is leads us to death as Christ died, or whether it leads us to a life of service for God, or whether it leads us well, to a fairly easy life, whatever God has purpose and plan for us, we ought to be humble and obedient to it. And we all want to, the nice house and a nice car and easy life, and then we want to get to heaven and hear, well done, now a good faithful servant. Sometimes that may happen, but the majority of the time it doesn't, does it? Most of the time the way of the cross is hard and long, isn't it? <coughs> it's not always filled with worldly pleasures and material possessions. <coughs> well, certainly God does bless his people. I'm not gonna say that just because you have things means that you're not right with God. God blesses and gives to those according as they can handle it. Sometimes maybe as a temptation, other times maybe as a, a trial, if you will. Sometimes it gives us what our, we ask for to show us that we really didn't need what we thought we needed. Yeah. But let us be as Christ was and humble ourselves and walk humbly with God and love mercy and let us do justice. You know, as I pointed out earlier, the natural man doesn't like these things. The natural man is meant against doing those types of things. And he might do a few of those things because that was the way he was raised. That's the way Mama said it ought to be. But as we can see very plainly in our world today, man is going farther and farther away from serving God, if you will. Farther and farther away from Staying upon just the basic truths of God's Word. Without Christ, all those things are pointless, though, aren't they? Without Christ, you can be doing all the right things, but you're not doing them the right way. So if you don't know Christ, I say we appoint you to Him. That, that you might be saved, that you might be born again. Marvel not that I say that you must be born again, Christ said. So without faith it is impossible to please him. Really the natural man cannot please him, he says over in Romans. Oh that you will be born again if you not if you don't know him as Savior. Oh for us that are saved, oh that you would simply serve him, not seek after things of this world, not be self seeking. Let's close with that. Uh,